sorry we're starting just a couple minutes late trying to get technical things worked out here. I'm really glad you made it out tonight and I hope that you'll enjoy the program. I'm Laura Kolaskowski. I'm from the Dayton area, from Beaver Creek, um, but I am a patient at Ohio Health and very deep, closely connected with Dr. Boster and the rest of them and their work. So it's a pleasure for me to be here tonight and help to moderate this program. Uh, you're being, this is put together by MS Views and News, which is a great organization, and I'd like to at this time introduce Stuart Schlossman, who is the founder of MS Views and News and kind of the, the big energy behind it. You think Dr. Boster has energy, they can match each other. So, Stuart? My name, for those that didn't hear it correctly from Laura, my name is Stuart Schlossman, and yes, I am president and founder of MS Views and News, and yes, I too have multiple sclerosis, and yes, I can run circles around Dr. Boster. <laughs> and you wanna know something? That's a real honor because like I said, I have multiple sclerosis, and I have found a way to keep my energy going and stay moderated throughout my day, and what I do, all that I do. Last year we did 45 programs in the United States, 45 programs, you say, wow, so what's the big deal? Well, how many weeks are there in the year? Yes, it's a big deal, all right? And we're providing so much so that with regards to this YouTube channel, for instance, last year, one year's time, we had over 100,000 views because people from around the world are knowing what we're doing. They see it on social media. They hear how crazy I am. They know how arrogant I am to make sure that you all are learning. And that's the whole name of the game, though, is to make sure that you can learn from this. So we hope that you use our services. We also have a social worker. And yes, we'll get Ohio Health as a social worker. But maybe you are on social media. And maybe Maybe you're connected to people in other states or even, I'll just say for the United States for now. And we have a social worker that takes calls from all over the United States and then what she does is she'll direct that person to a social worker in the community of where they are living. So again, if they're afraid to find somebody, they could just contact our social, work, social worker and then be redirected. And if you're in Ohio, we are only going to direct you to Sarah Grimm, who's going to speak to you in a few minutes. Okay, all right, so tonight we want to thank, MS Views and News would like to thank Ohio Health, Ohio Health MS, for partnering with us to do a series of programs which began last night, is happening tonight, and we'll be, we will be back again in October to do that much more. Also, please, we all, everywhere we go, we ask support group leaders to be involved with our programs, and I don't know how many are here tonight, I do know of one, his name is Scott Morgan, and I'm going to ask Scott to come on up, and we're gonna allow him to speak for about 90 seconds about his group, and there's Scott. So, and then we're gonna get into our program. But while Scott's walking up, I'm just gonna let you know real brief. After me is gonna be Laura, and after Laura, we're gonna have Sarah Grimm, and then Dr. Nicholas is going to speak, and then Corrine is going to speak about pelvic floor exercise. I can't wait to see what that's about. All right, and then we're gonna do a Q&A for about 30 minutes, and then Dr. Boster will be up to speak last. So come on up, Scott, have a few words. Thank you. My name is Scott. Uh, I am a leader of a peer support group in Dayton, Ohio. We meet every last Thursday of every month at hospice on Wilmington Avenue. We meet at seven o'clock and we usually go between nine, 10 o'clock at night. Very informal group. We talk about our problems, <clears throat> our families, whatever we wanna talk about. It's, it's not structured and it's, uh, like I said, very informal. Uh, I have a advertisement in the city paper and you can contact me through that and I'll set you up to come to our meetings. Uh, our next one is tomorrow. I know that's pretty pretty quick, but uh, like I said, it's uh, the fourth Thursday of, of every month and we'd like to see you out there. And I'd like to also say uh, real quick that the U <clears throat> University of Dayton offers a swim every Saturday for uh, people with MS to go and we do aerobics in the water, very low, impact on your your joints and it's very easy very informal again we have uh, therapists in the pool with us and uh, it's free they have uh, showers there they have uh, locker rooms 
And uh, like I said, it's uh, every Saturday, and that's from 11 a.m. until noon. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. All right, so next up, we're going to ask Laura to come on up. And then if you want to speak with me after the program about anything about my desire to run circles around Dr. Boster, you can see me at that time. Okay, come on, Laura. I'm here. Great. I'm here. Are we all set with my deck, Bill? I'm glad Scott did a shout out about that aquatic program. It's a program I'm really proud of because I personally started it about five years ago in Dayton. And I mention that only because I challenge each one of you, if you have an idea, no matter how crazy or impossible it may seem to you, try to, try to make it happen. Because I was just one person looking at that pool because I worked at the university and I said, why aren't we using this for other things other than the students, you know, so we worked it out. It took us a while to do it, but it was great. So I challenge everybody in this room to find something you'd like to do. I'm here tonight to talk about a theme that's really dear to me, and it has to do with what I was just saying. It's about choices we get to make when we ha we're told we have a mess. He forgets how th that I'm taller than, <laughs> than Stuart. But it comes down to choices. You know, I was diagnosed in 2008 with MS. And I could have just gone home, closed the doors, pulled the shades, and say, that's it. Things are over. But for me, I made some choices. I was really happy I did. And you see the slide here? I love this cartoon. If you can't read it in the back, I'll just read it quickly. First guy says, what are you doing? And the other one says, life has overwhelmed me, so I have shoved my head in the sand. Well, why would you do that? Because re ignoring reality is the next best thing to changing it. So you have a choice. Do you want to ignore it or you want to change it? I want you to get your head out of the sand. There's a whole lot of ways you can do this. It's easy to say, oh, Dr. Boster, Dr. Nicholas, all these people, whoever your neurologist is, they're going to take care of me. I don't have to do any of that myself. But you have to take charge of this disease. I'm telling you, it's your disease. Own it. First thing I want you to do is assert control over other factors that you know you can control. This is my do as I say, not as I do lecture, okay? Because a bunch of these things I gotta work on, I'm not perfect at it. But I want you to think about, make sure you're compliant with your therapy. If you smoke, please stop. I was, I had to, it's not easy, but it's worth it. Um, stress, stress is really important. We know that's a big factor with MS. So if you're, if you're feeling stress in your life, a little bit's good because it keeps us healthy. But when you're starting to feel a lot of stress, I hope you have something to turn to, like yoga, meditation, reading a book, taking a walk around the block. You know, we all have ways that we de-stress and keep those in mind. You might want to write them down even if you're feeling stressed and say, pull out that list, I'm going to do one of these things. Lack of exercise, obesity, sleep, diet. I'm going to skip over those because those are the ones I'm really bad on. Okay, I'm going to work on the end of this. But the final one I'm really good about because it's isolation. I don't want people sitting at home thinking they're in this themselves, that they're the only people who suffer with XYZ syn syndrome or they don't understand the financial burden or the emotional problems that come with having a chronic disease with, with no cure to it right now today. So I want you to get out of the rut of being isolated. Next thing I want you to do, our physicians, you know, we all know about health care and all the changes that are going on and how hard it is to get even get an appointment with your doctor sometimes when you need it. And you get in there and you have that half hour and you've got a list of questions this long that you want to make, you want to get through. I challenge you to write all of your questions down, but then prioritize the top three questions you have that you really need to get answered because the odds are you're not going to make it through 20 or 30 questions, right? You're not going to have that time. In your appointment, take your notes so you remember what you've talked about. At Ohio Health and other places, so many places now have my chart as your system, so when you leave, it's nice you have those written notes. But there may be other things you would like to add to it, so be sure, take your notes for later. And then finally, and this is really important, it's okay to disagree with your medical care, with your provider. This is your MS, it's not theirs. If you don't like the treatment, if you're having problems with it, if you're not comfortable with the decisions being made about your care, it's okay to speak up. It really is. And they will honor that, and they will listen to you, and they will work with you. 
MS Views and News has a wonderful tool online. I know in your confirmation email, Stuart sent you the link to this. This is a printable um, tool you can, a lot of times it's really awkward to talk to the doctor. Oh, my bladder, oh, sexual function, things like that. But we can write it down on that piece of paper and just slide it across the table and say, here, we need to talk about this. Um, it's a great tool, so take advantage of it. And um, the other thing we can do in empowerment is educate yourself. There's so much out there that we can learn about MS that's legitimate, but there's a lot of bad stuff too. And you think about how, um, looking at the age of the group here, some of you are not old enough to remember. Used to be we had to go to the library, go to the reference desk, ask the librarian to borrow that medical book that we could check out for two hours and sit at a desk and read it. And we're all the way through that. We've gone through pamphlets, videos, electronic information we get on the internet, and now we can find everything on the internet. And the problem is, it's not always the right stuff. So I want to be sure you're looking, that you're educating yourself, but you're looking in the right places. Through this continuum of education and things that were available to us, there were some constants that I really, you know, as I put this together, it occurred to me, not, one thing has not changed over this. And one is that bottom line of the advocacy groups, like the MS Society or MS Views and News, we know they're valuable sources we can use. But beyond that, we have our doctors, nurses, therapists, everybody in our medical team. They've been there the whole time. So when you need education tips, when you want to know where to go to look for things, ask them. You've got great sources there. And then the final step of empowerment, um, this, is, this is something that's deeply personal to me. It's I Conquer, uh, I Conquer MS. Hopefully you picked up the M&Ms and you ate them as your appetizer. I Conquer MS is a patient-powered, patient-led network that's designed to do research that's important to us. It's really easy to join. You go online. I know a couple people in the room here are members of I Conquer. You go online. You enter your basic demographic information. Um, and then we'll be sending out surveys asking you to complete those research tools. The most exciting part about I Conquer MS, though, is we have the opportunity there to submit our questions. You know, we're living with the MS, not the researchers. And is there anyone here in the room who's ever had a researcher say, what would you like us to look at? Raise your hand if you have. I talk about this all the time, and they still have not asked me, what would I like to, what would I like to know? This is our opportunity to submit our questions, things that are important to us, things that will be impactful and meaningful immediately, and we connect those questions with the appropriate researchers. So I would like to challenge all of you, take control through this empowerment, join I Conquer MS and help us find a cure because we now have 3,000 people who are enrolled in sharing their, sharing their healthcare data and our ultimate goal is 20,000, which is only 5% of, of the United States population of people with MS. So I really challenge you to join us. There's a change to the program as we discussed, um, as Stuart pointed out, but we're gonna jump into this here. It sort of flows this way. First, we're gonna have Sarah Grimm's gonna talk just really briefly about the social work um, that she does through the center. Then it'll be Dr. Nicholas and then Katrina, right? Karina, I'm sorry, um, talking about PT after Dr. Nicholas and Karina speak. We'll do question and answers then. But I would encourage you, you have paper, pencils, all that. As they talk, write down your questions so you remember them. I forget my questions all the time. So write down your questions and be prepared um, when that time comes to ask them. This time, I'd like to introduce you to this wonderful person who does the non-medical things for Ohio Health. Sarah Grimm is a licensed social worker, and she's there at the MS clinic for us, and she wants to just tell you a little bit about how to reach her and what she can do. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, I'm Sarah Grimm. Um, I'm the social worker for the Ohio Health MS Clinic. And some of you may have met me if you come to our clinic. Um, so it's nice to see everybody. And uh, tonight, um, you're going to um, learn a lot of great information. So I just want to take just one or two minutes and piggyback on um, um, what Laura 
had discussed and really encourage people to get involved. Uh, we do several social um, support groups at Ohio Health and it's amazing to see the connections um, that individuals living with MS um, can make with each other. And so it's great to hear about the group in Dayton and I'm gonna pick um, his brain a little bit later, learn more about his group so I can be recommending that uh, to folks that live in that area. So I really just wanna say um, hello and um, encourage you to get involved in support groups, educational events, um, and things such as that. So that's all I really have. Have a great um, evening and um, enjoy the presentations. I would point out that Sarah is that person when you go into the office and you hand your, your physician paperwork to fill out for, say, work or disability or FMLA, it all goes to Sarah. She's the paperwork guru and the crew. So um, eventually you will connect with Sarah if you have to do at least paperwork. But do take advantage of her services. At this point, you get to hear, like I said, we were out of order with that program. Dr. Jacqueline Nicholas, I met her when she became a fellow with uh, Dr. Boster. And we're really fortunate to have her at Ohio Health. She's back to, come on up, Dr. Nicholas. I'll, talk about you when you head this way. She's got a lot of specialties, but she really likes to specialize in spasticity, if you have problems with that. But MS in women is her topic for tonight, and I'm gonna turn this over to her. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, so if, if you were around at the program last night, I did speak about the same topic. So hopefully we'll really nail it home, and I'll try to give you some new tidbits today. Um, you know, when Stuart asked me to give a talk, I thought about giving a talk on men's issues, but we all know that I only have 30 minutes and men have a lot of issues, and so I really couldn't do that here tonight in that amount of time. I'm just kidding. We love you guys, too. Um, so uh, women's issues in MS is a, a really important topic, and I think that there are very specific things related to um, hormones in women that uh, that we need to key in on when we care for, for any of you during the course of your MS. So I'm going to go through some of that and then I'll be happy to answer any questions you have on women's issues in MS or MS in general uh, when we finish up. So. As you all know, MS is actually very, very common. In the United States, there's about a 1 in 750 chance of developing MS. That was really shocking to me when I learned to become a neurologist. You know, I thought MS is something that you learn about in medical school, but I've, I felt like even watching people, seeing patients in the hospital, I didn't think that many people had it. And then, of course, when I went into the world of MS and started seeing MS patients every day, it seemed like it was incredibly common. And it's such a challenge for patients, um, for all of you who are dealing with MS, because you may have a lot of symptoms that are more on the inside that you don't show on the outside. And that can be hard for others to understand. And so I always like to make a point of talking about that. Those are really important symptoms to share with us when you're in the clinic. Um, because if you don't talk about them, we don't know about them. We try to ask about them, but sometimes we forget. So MS, you know, we still don't know, despite the fact that we've known about this disease for so long, what the exact cause is. I think someday we will, but as we go along, we learn every year there are more factors that increase the risk of MS. You guys have all heard about low vitamin D and the importance of vitamin D supplementation and how that can in increase risk of MS, and also how that may make the MS disease course more aggressive if you have lower levels. So that's been something incredibly interesting. If you've lived up here in Ohio for most of your life since childhood, unfortunately, living further away from the equator actually greatly increases your risk of MS. And furthermore, recent reports have actually shown that high salt diet may also impact uh, the increased incidence of MS and other autoimmune diseases, but that story is still out. So there are 2.1 million individuals living with MS worldwide and 135 out of every 100,000 people in the US. And the typical age of onset is age 30. And that's why I think this is a really important topic to address, because women are affected by MS during their childbearing years. And sometimes when we're focusing on a disease, we forget about all the other things going on in someone's life. Someone who uh, is getting married and maybe considering having children, or somebody who uh, is you know, going through menopause, and what issues are they going to face? In MS, 
it's so much more common for a woman to develop MS than a man. We used to say it was two to one, and then over time we've really seen that it's more along the lines of three to one. So I think it's really important early on when I see patients in clinic to talk about this because um, certainly, you know, MS medications in general, although they're very, very important to be on to protect you from disease activity, if somebody's considering becoming pregnant, it's an important topic to bring up with your clinician. Uh, it's not safe to be on these therapies during attempts at conception and pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, that's with a caveat that I'll talk to you about in a little bit. There is a therapy that really has quite good data long term that's uh, shown to be relatively safe that could be used. Uh, certainly with our disease modifying therapies, we would want somebody to be on contraception uh, because certainly there are certain risks that we would be concerned about if you were on a therapy and accidentally became pregnant. So a long time ago, doctors actually used to tell women with MS, don't get pregnant, it's gonna make your disease worse. Well, it couldn't be further from the truth. What they actually discovered over time is that it wasn't pregnancy itself, but it was actually that first trimester postpartum. So we call it the fourth trimester, which always scares me because I think three trimesters is more than enough. But the fourth trimester, what we see is that there's this huge drop in hormone levels in the estrogen and progesterone levels, and that results in a greatly increased risk of relapse. And so what we found is that pregnancy is actually protective, and I'll show you a really neat picture in a little bit that shows you how with each successive trimester that risk decreases. The unfortunate thing is obviously we can't make somebody pregnant forever, and I'm not sure how to apply this to men. Um, last I checked, they can't carry babies, but maybe someday. So MS doesn't actually impair fertility, and that's also an important note. A lot of patients have asked me that over time, and so we'll get into talking about that as we go along. And then certainly there's no uh, reason why a woman with MS can't have an epidural prior to delivering her baby. We used to think that that might cause inflammation, but there were actually large uh, studies done in multiple women with MS who had epidurals and those who did not. And there was no difference in the risk of relapse in that fourth trimester. And so overall, you know, we would, we would encourage any woman who's interested in having children uh, to talk with us about that and then also to um, consider doing so. There are certain caveats. If somebody has a highly aggressive disease course, we certainly wouldn't want to jump and say that's a good idea to get pregnant right now because that woman may be off a therapy or maybe the one therapy that we can consider using during pregnancy uh, may not be effective enough for her. And so from long-term studies that have been done, we know that the degree of how stable someone's MS has been in the year prior actually predicts how great a chance she has of having a relapse either during pregnancy and in that fourth trimester postpartum. And so it's an important discussion to have. What about the risk of MS? This is a concern of, of many individuals, men and women. You know, I've got MS, what, do, what am I gonna do now? What does that mean for my children that I've already had? Or what does that mean for my sister or my brother, or my parents? Well, I think this should be really reassuring for you that the risk of developing MS in your offspring, if you're the only parent that has MS of your child, then the risk is only two to three percent. And so that's an incredibly low risk, and we know that encouraging your kids to not smoke, which is something that I'm sure all of you do, you're not saying, here's a pack of cigarettes, um, congratulations. Uh, and also making sure that their vitamin D levels are within good range. And you know, generally just having your children check in with their doctor and ask what might be a, a safe amount for them to take and maybe if they should have their level checked. Those are two things that we know decrease the risk of MS. So I like this graph because I think it explains a lot about what we see in women with MS during the reproductive cycle. So if we look here in the first part of the graph, this is indicating pre-puberty. So actually along this axis here, you can see that the higher we go up, the higher those levels of estrogen and progesterone rise. And interestingly, during the pre-puberty period, MS is equal between males and females. Once those hormone levels spike during menses, MS is much more common in women than it is in men. And then certainly during pregnancy, when we see this sharp spike in estrogen and progesterone, this is protective. And so those very high levels actually protect against MS attacks. 
And then when those levels drop off postpartum, that's, a, that's that very high risk period for MS in that first three months. And then generally, MS disease activity returns back to what it previously was. But then there's a problem there. We see that in women during menopause, we see many women with MS reporting that they feel their symptoms have worsened. And that's something where we're really lacking a lot of research. There really hasn't been that much done, and I think that we need to do more. But when we interview women with MS, and actually there was a, a large study of women with MS who were interviewed and asked about their disease course, they said, yes, my physical functioning is worse. My memory and thinking is worse. And they really felt that that sharply changed at menopause onset. And so there's a question about hormone replacement therapy and what should we be doing and is this MS or is it natural aging? And so that's something that I'm hoping we'll find more answers for you over time. So what about sexual dysfunction? Well, this is a big topic. It's a big topic for everyone, and it's sometimes a topic that people are nervous to talk about. It's incredibly common in MS. So I encourage you when you're seeing your doctor, if you're having this issue, please bring it up. There are a lot of things that we can do about it, and we also have to understand what it is exactly that's going on. So here I've listed a bunch of the different potential causes. So certainly when we look at these categories, you know, we think, well, I have MS, so my sexual dysfunction must be due to the fact that I have MS. Well, not necessarily. In the setting of MS, if you have a lesion in the spinal cord that perhaps has caused you to have numbness in the down there's or dryness, that could be such an issue for somebody to uh, feel like they want to engage in sexual activity. Certainly decreased libido is a major issue. But then we look at the other symptoms that go along with MS. What about if I'm having problems and I feel like I'm going to the bathroom so frequently, I've got to get up to use the restroom all the time, or I feel really constipated, or gosh, every time I move, I get a sharp spasm and my leg hurts, so I can't even think about having sex. Well, I think that's something that you also have to bring up because fortunately, um, with all of these symptoms, we have something that we can do about them. And so we want to improve your quality of life and certainly uh, sexual health has been linked to quality of life and is very important. And then there are the tertiary issues. So what about uh, if we have depression or anxiety or we worry about our self-image and maybe MS plays a role in that as well. These are all things that can be addressed and so I encourage you to talk about them and ask questions with your doctor. So how do we manage MS when somebody isn't yet pregnant, but they're thinking about getting pregnant? Well, let's take a look at the FDA-approved MS disease-modifying therapies. Um, up here, you can see them by their generic name. What I want to point out for you over here, you see these letters. Well, the FDA actually just did away with these letters about a year ago, but these are the standard for most of our therapies up until the most recent therapy uh, that was FDA approved called Diclizumab a couple weeks ago. But this category B, that is actually the safest uh, medication for MS. That uh, The category B basically means it wasn't studied in women with MS to check for safety, but in all data that we have, animal data, and in long-term cohort data, this is, is safe. Now the FDA does not recommend any of these medications for use during pregnancy and contraception. However, myself along with many other MS specialists would strongly encourage a woman who's planning to conceive or who is pregnant or who is breastfeeding to stay on disease modifying therapy and to use this therapy because it's been shown to be incredibly safe. The other therapies I strongly would not recommend, um, the interferons, fingolimod, natalizumab, tecfidera, lemtrada, mitoxantrone, teraflunamide. Teraflunamide is one, uh, it's called abagio, and that's actually an absolute contraindication for a male or a woman if they're planning to become pregnant. So obviously a male can't become pregnant, but if he's hoping to uh, get his partner pregnant, that medication is excreted in the semen. And so he should be off that medication for two years prior to attempts at conception, or he can undergo a rapid elimination procedure, and there's a medication that we can use to help clear that from your system. The same for a woman. So I'm going to go ahead and move along, but please feel free to write down questions and ask me when I finish up here. So again, this is just to show you a little bit of information about that medication that myself, along with many other MS specialists, use um, in women who are planning to become pregnant. And I like it because um, many of you who've had children in the fa past may realize that, um, well, gosh, when you plan to become pregnant, it doesn't always happen immediately. And so certainly having MS can also make that a nerve-wracking time because you're trying to get pregnant, but you 
know at the same time that you're at risk to accumulate more problems because you may be off therapy or you're not on the therapy that's best for you. And so I think that's a very important topic to understand. It's important to know as well that MS is, it does not cause problems with fertility. Fortunately, it does not affect fertility. Our medications for MS, the disease modifying therapies, have also not shown to affect fertility, but sometimes we use certain immunosuppressants off-label, and these would be things like cyclophosphamide. When I say off-label, it means it's not your typical MS medicine. It's not something that FDA has approved for MS, but maybe your MS was really aggressive and your doctor said we have to use something different, something very strong. So that would, that would certainly be a concern and something that would be talked about before somebody would use that in you. Um, but I think more importantly, the reason why we may see individuals with MS having a little more difficulty getting pregnant could certainly be related to decreased libido and uh, you know, decreased uh, sexual activity just as a result of the other symptoms that they're experiencing. So there's been a lot of talk about fertility treatments, and this is a common question that I get asked by young folks in the clinic. You know, um, I want to get pregnant. We've talked about the fact that I'm going to go off the medication that I'm on, and I might go on this Copaxone medicine, but I really want to limit that time that I'm off my therapy. Well, um, lots of people think about, should I go see a fertility specialist? I know that helped my friend get pregnant. Should I do that? Well, really, um, it's, it's not recommended at this point. We haven't done a lot of studies, but there is some pretty good evidence to show that if you do any kind of uh, fertility treatment, that actually in women will increase those levels of estrogen and progesterone, similar to the pregnant state. And then when those drop, if it's unsuccessful, unfortunately, there's a very high risk of relapse. And so that's something right now that I, I don't recommend unless we've you know, tried for a long time and, um, and we need to go there. So this is that graph I was showing you. This is one of my favorite graphs. This was uh, done by Con Favreau, who's a famous MS researcher. And basically what he looked at in this group of over 200 women was what happens in terms of relapses when we look at the year prior to pregnancy, pregnancy, and then ultimately there was a study that looked at the two-year follow-up. So along here, the higher that you go up here, the more relapses you've had. And then along here, our each hash mark is a trimester before pregnancy, during, and after. This gray bar is pregnancy. So you see here, this is, somebody, this is the average relapse rate in the year prior. And then during pregnancy, we see that decline. With each successive trimester, that drops. So pregnancy is protective against MS relapses. But then unfortunately, in that fourth trimester postpartum, that risk really rises. And it's much higher than it was even before they became pregnant. Fortunately, that drops back to what it was previously over time. When people have relapses during pregnancy or breastfeeding, we can treat them. We try not to treat them in the first trimester just because potential risks to the fetus. Cleft palate is one of the concerns, but other than that, I always call our friendly OBGYN when I need to do it, and they always laugh at me and say, why are you calling? It's okay to give them steroids, but I think it's really important that we work together with your gynecologist. There are certain types of steroids that are preferred. Solumedrol, many of you probably heard of that or received it before, an IV steroid, and then also prednisone that would be preferred. Decadron is one that would cross into the placenta, so that would be less preferred. Um, and certainly if someone is breastfeeding during receiving steroids, it's recommended that they pump and dump. IVIG is another medication. We don't use it a lot in MS. There's some evidence in optic neuritis, uh, but this is a medicine that's been uh, fairly safe, and um, if we needed to use it, we could consider it. I like this slide not because it's all nerdy and sciencey and you see all these weird dots, but basically what it shows you is that if you look at this group here, these two lines, these are showing us women who either never had children and had MS or women who had kids before their MS symptoms onset. And then you look over here and you see women with MS who had kids after they developed MS or they had them before and after. And basically what this graph tells you is that if women became pregnant after the onset of their MS, they did better. They did better physically long term. And so I think that's interesting and I think it's, it's nice to look at, especially for young women who are thinking about it and saying, oh my goodness, there's this increased risk in that fourth trimester, should I do it? Well, this shows that actually it may not be a concern long term. 
on your long-term disease course. So what about postpartum? And again, I just really like pictures of cute babies, so I just put them throughout here so that even if you're falling asleep, you can look at really cute pictures. So breastfeeding. This has been a, a long controversial topic in MS, and lots of studies actually showed maybe it's, maybe it's slightly helpful, maybe it's not helpful at all, maybe it's harmful, but what we ultimately found out is these studies that were done over time weren't looking at it the right way. So, you know, nowadays we have the option of formula, and that's a wonderful option uh, for nutrition for babies. But many women want to breastfeed as well, and we want to support that. Well, sometimes women uh, are busy and they decide, I'm going to breastfeed, and I'm also going to supplement formula. formula. When we looked at these studies, they actually grouped women who breastfed exclusively, meaning no formula, and women who received formula, or who didn't receive formula, who gave their children formula in addition to breastfeeding in the same group. But we know that their hormone profiles are different. If someone's breastfeeding exclusively, the estrogen and progesterone levels are higher. And so um, we've actually seen that that exclusive breastfeeding is protective. Now, it's something careful that we look at for each individual. So if somebody is uh, having a child and they're planning to breastfeed, um, it's something that, again, we're going to see you very close and follow up after you have your baby. We're going to monitor you. And if you're starting to have uh, more attacks or more disease activity, then we're going to have a serious talk because we want you to be there for the long run, taking good care of your kids, running around with them. And so um, if, if breastfeeding is causing your disease to be more active because you're not on an appropriate therapy, then we'll make that decision together about when to stop. This is another nerd slide that basically just shows lots of studies that have looked at this. And if you see a dot on this side of this long bar, it means those studies favored breastfeeding, meaning showing that it was protective and lowered the risk of postpartum relapses in patients with MS. This is another slide basically showing the same thing. So what about parenting? Well, I think this is an important thing to think about as well. How many people in this room are parents? A lot of you. It's, it's an important job. I think it's the most important job that we have. And so it's something that we need to prepare for. Certainly when we have a disease that makes us tired and can take us out, of, out for a little bit of time, depending when we have relapses, as you all know, it's so important whether you have kids or not to have a good support system. But this is something that I always talk with my young men and my young women who are planning to have kids, um, that it's important to think about this so that, that you're the best supported possible when that child arrives. There's a newsletter. Uh, if you do have kids or grandkids, I love this newsletter. It's called Keep Smiling. It's a, a play on the word Mylan, um, but it's very informative and nice. And so if you'd like to receive that, just contact the National MS Society. There's also a camp called Camp Connect, um, and this happens every year. And so your children or your grandchildren are welcome to go. They do lots of fun sports, and then they also learn a little bit about MS and share uh, what they've experienced. I went out a couple years ago um, to talk with them and answer answer their questions on MS, and I'll tell you that the questions these children asked me were harder than any grand rounds or conference that I presented on to a group of highly intelligent doctors um, in neurology and MS specialists. So these kids know, even though we think sometimes they don't know, they know a lot. So menopause and MS, I alluded to the fact that this is a major issue in MS. It's something that uh, we don't know enough about, but certainly something that's very bothersome for our patients. We don't know whether that worsening of symptoms is due to underlying neurodegeneration related to the disease, or whether it's actually something related to the hormone profile of menopause itself. We don't see that women at menopause and following have more relapses, but we see that they generally have more progression of those symptoms. And so the majority of those symptoms are fatigue, bladder difficulties, and so those are important topics to please bring up and that, that should be talked about regularly when you're meeting with your MS specialist. So again, take home points. I know I covered a lot of issues and maybe they weren't applicable to you tonight, but I think it's important to know because I'm sure that you have other friends with MS that you can share these points with. And again, men, there are lots of topics that are very important to you that, um, that I think we can dedicate another talk to about sometime soon in the future.
Living with MS isn't easy. You guys could tell us that far better than we could tell you that. But please, when you have concerns, anything that bothers you, I always tell my patients, please let us know. Um, if you don't let us know, we don't know about it. You can always tell us, it's something I want you to know, but I don't want you to give me anything for it or treat me for it. Um, and again, support systems are available. Sarah Grimm at our center has done an amazing job of setting up uh, support groups and educational events, and so we couldn't be more thankful for those, and I, many of our patients have uh, experienced that. You don't have to be a patient at the center to come to them. Anybody's welcome. Women and men with MS can and do lead meaningful lives. I'm really proud of you guys for coming out tonight. Coming out to these events are very important so you can be empowered, so you can take control of your disease. So continue to fight back. Take good care of yourself, like Laura said. Take your MS disease modifying therapy. Eat right, exercise, get some sleep, and reach out for help when you need it. Thank you. All right, so our next speaker up tonight is Karina Syracuse. Syracuse what? Syracuse. Syracuse. I was told to remember this for Syracuse, but I didn't like that school, so I couldn't remember. I have to remember Ohio, right? Ohio, which Ohio do I have to remember? Not, not school. Which, which, which football program am I supposed to remember? Okay, got it. Thank you. All right, so Karina is going to speak to you about pelvic floor exercise, and this should be very interesting because this is the first topic that we've ever had speaking about, the first person speaking about this at any of our programs. So I look forward to hearing about it. Great, thank you. All right, thank you very much. So I am here to talk about bowel and bladder care uh, with uh, patients with MS. Again, uh, you can ask me any questions. I get a lot of people that say this is a really embarrassing question to ask. However, at this point, I've kind of heard it all. So um, feel free to ask me any questions. Um, when we're done, there is no question that is too embarrassing. And uh, again, I um, will warn you that I say, um, I heard Dr. Nicholas say at one point, the downstairs place, I will say vagina and penis during this um, topic, so fair warning. Uh, again, I uh, speak all the time about um, pelvic floor and uh, all the different uh, problems that can go along with the pelvic floor. So I'm hoping to teach you guys a little bit about that. Uh, one of the reasons why you don't hear much about it is because there are very few pelvic floor therapists out there. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what a pelvic floor therapist is. I am a physical therapist. I just have a little bit of extra training. So well, who am I? I am a, a pelvic floor physical therapist. So I was a regular PT. I went to PT school. I get a lot of people that ask me, why in the world did you pick this as a specialty uh, with physical therapy? Well, number one, I hate sports. And number two, um, and, I'm, and I'm probably the most unathletic and clumsiest physical therapist you will ever meet in your life. Uh, but I also, my patients get better. And so that's why I picked pelvic floor physical therapy. So what it, we are is uh, we are a postdoctoral program. So after you go through and you get your physical therapy degree, you have to practice for a little while and then you can go on and get some extra training as a pelvic floor therapist. Uh, so I actually teach around the country for the certification program that allows you to be a pelvic floor physical therapist. Uh, I also am one of two board certified pelvic floor therapists in the state of Ohio. So there's me and there's a gal in Cincinnati and that is it. <laughs> Um, so for a board certification, you do have to work for, uh, it's, it's kind of like board certification for physicians. You have to work for about uh, five years in the field of pelvic floor physical therapy. You have to write a case study, see a lot of patients. Um, and again, I said I'm a, a certified instructor, so I instruct other PTs around the country uh, on how to be a pelvic floor therapist. My passion, there are a lot of different subsets of pelvic floor PT, is uh, pelvic floor PT with the neurologic patient. So uh, I actually started my career as a pediatric physical therapist, and it's quite a jump from working with kids to staring at genitals all day. But um, you, you, it, it's a great jump there. Um, but uh, that is kind of how I got my passion for working with uh, clients with neurologic dysfunction, because uh, I found that I had the greatest impact, and there were so few people that understood a lot of the problems that go along with any sort of neurological disorder. 
So what is pelvic floor physical therapy? So I'm primarily working with the muscles of the pelvic floor and that's why it's physical therapists that do this because physical therapists are the muscle experts. That's what we learn about in PT school. And you have actually a lot of muscles down in your pelvic floor. I'm gonna show you guys just how many you have. And uh, men and women, you both have the same muscles. Women just have an extra hole. That's the only difference, okay? Um, but everybody has the same pelvic floor muscles regardless of your gender. Uh, I also work extensively on bowel and bladder behavioral habits and we all have horrible bladder habits. Uh, every time I give a talk, no matter what who the audience is, I always talk about good bladder habits versus bad bladder habits and I always see everybody sheepishly starting to look down as I, as I talk about those bad bladder habits. So everybody, regardless of your function, can learn a little bit about uh, what we should and should not do with our bladder. We also work on core stabilization. So a lot of people think that all I do is kegels all day long. If all I did was kegels all day long, I would be bored out of my mind. So there's a lot more to pelvic floor dysfunction and bowel and bladder dysfunction than just doing kegel exercises. And side note, most people do kegel exercises wrong. So I have lots of people that come in and they tell me, oh, I do my kegels every day and I test them and 90% of them are doing them wrong. So, um, so we we kind of teach about the right way to do a kegel and then we also talk about some of those other exercises and then especially for my clients with MS we talk about muscle relaxation so you can have spasticity in your pelvic floor muscles and what that causes is that's when you sit down on the toilet and you go to have either a bowel movement or you go to urinate and you can't go and you sit there, and you sit there, and you turn some water on, and you hum, and you think about other things, and then you can go to the bathroom. That's actually because of tight pelvic floor muscles. And in that case, kegels are actually the opposite of what you should be doing. So this is one of the reasons why we really encourage everybody to see a pelvic floor therapist so that we can specifically evaluate where on the spectrum your pelvic floor falls. So let's talk a little bit about the pelvic floor muscles. So uh, this is a female pelvic floor. And so what this picture is showing you is that you have two layers of pelvic floor muscles. So we have what we call superficial muscles. Those are a little bit more on the top. And then we have deep pelvic floor muscles. You can see just how many pelvic floor muscles you have and how complicated and intricate they are. Now, uh, men are set up a little bit better for continence than women are. Uh, one, they have one less hole and two, they just have a longer urethra and so it allows them to be continent a little bit longer. Also, men don't have babies. So um, that's probably the number one problem that causes pelvic floor dysfunction in women is childbirth. And for those of you that have given birth, it's child number three that is usually statistically the straw that breaks the camel ba camel's back. So um, you can tell your third child that it's all their fault or if you are the third child, just know that you ruined your mom. <laughs> So, um, so uh, these are the. This is just another view of the pelvic floor muscles. Um, so this is a male pelvic floor. You can see because there are only two holes. Uh, and so what we're looking at is the urethra is up top, close to your pubic bone. Your bladder actually sits right behind your pubic bone. So when I tell, when I have a lot of people that kind of are pointing up here to their abdomen and saying, "Oh, my bladder," your bladder is not up there. Your bladder, unless you're pregnant. If you're actively pregnant, then it may be higher but if you're not pregnant it's going to be really really low and that's where you actually have bladder dysfunction but these are the muscles that are actually going to contract when you are going to do a kegel exercise um, the best part about kegels is that nobody should be able to tell that you're doing them. So when I have somebody doing kegels and I see them bouncing up and down on their chair, that's probably not doing a kegel correctly. Um, but the reason why I like to show this picture is it shows just kind of how intricate those, these muscles are. And then the other thing is, is that these muscles are bowl shaped. So it's not like showing somebody a bicep curl if their arm is weak. I can't do this and say, all right, that's how you do a kegel. It's really kind of a, a multifaceted contraction and so that's one of the reasons why you really have to see a certified pelvic floor therapist in order to make sure that you're doing it correctly.
So this is looking down from the top of the pelvis. And so this is just another view showing those pelvic floor muscles. The muscles that are highlighted in green here, it's a group of muscles that we call the levator ani. And they do exactly what they sound. They elevate the anus when you squeeze them. So the other common misconception about a Kegel exercise is that it's just a squeeze. That's actually not true. It's a squeeze and a lift. It should elevate all of the structures on the inside. It should squeeze off the anal area and the urethra, but it's also a lift. And that's why it's helpful to kind of see it as this bowl, because if you see everything contract all at once, it's going to really elevate everything. So what do the pelvic floor muscles do? They have a lot of functions. So we call it the four S's. Supportive, so we have a lot of organs in our pelvis. Again, women have one extra, one main, mainly in the pelvic cavity, um, but your bladder is in front for women, then uh, you have the uterus in the middle, and then you have your rectum and your anus behind that. So the pelvic floor muscles really serve to support all of those organs and keep them from falling down. They also have a sphincteric role, meaning that they squeeze. So that is what keeps us continent. So normally, as you're all sitting here, unless one of you is actively going to the bathroom, which then we may need somebody to clean up, um, your muscles are contracted. And that's another common misconception. Those muscles are contracted all the time. The only time they should be relaxed is when you are actively having a bowel movement or urinating. The rest of the time, those muscles maintain a nice low level of contraction. And so that's that sphincteric role of those muscles. They close off the urethra and they close off the anal area in order to keep you continent. Stabilizers. So the pelvic floor muscles are part of the core. You hear a lot from us physical therapists about core stabilization. The problem with our core muscles, though, is it's kind of like a pop can or soda can, depending on what part of the country you're from. But you have different walls. So our abdominal muscles and our back muscles kind of form the round part of that can. Our diaphragm, or that big breath muscle up top, forms the top of the can. And then our pelvic floor forms the bottom of the can. The problem is, is that if you have weakness in any part of those muscles, when you do something like cough or sneeze or bear down, that pressure is going to go somewhere and it's always going to go to the weakest part. So for a lot of people, that is their pelvic floor. Their pelvic floor is the weakest part of the core. So when they cough or they sneeze, all of that pressure is directed downward and you pee your pants. So it's really a, a part of the core stabilizers. The other thing is, is that your pelvic floor actually contracts before you do any sort of movement. So even just sitting and reaching for a fork across the table, your pelvic floor should contract. And what it does is it holds everything up, it supports those pelvic organs, keeps everything closed, but it also helps support you so that you can move all of your other limbs. So that, that supportive function is really, really important. And finally, sexual. So Dr. Nicholas was talking a little bit about sexual dysfunction. One of the causes of sexual dysfunction is pelvic floor muscle weakness or tightness. And this is where I get a lot of flowers and chocolates when I fix it. So um, one of the things that we can do as pelvic floor therapists is that we can help treat some of those sexual dysfunction problems um, if they are related to the pelvic floor. So uh, if your pelvic floor is too weak, it actually impedes your ability to have an orgasm. If your pelvic floor is too tight, it impedes your ability to actually have, for women, to, to to have successful penetration and for men to achieve an erection. So sexual dysfunction is related to the pelvic floor. And I get that question a lot. People come to me and they say, why is my doctor sending me to a physical therapist because I can't have sex? Um, that's the fun part of my job. That's when I get to talk about that all day. But it really is very, very important to have a functioning pelvic floor for that. So this is just another picture um, of uh, that supportive function of the pelvic floor. So what happens is, is when these muscles that run along the bottom are not 
uh, nice and strong and contracting properly, you get all of that pressure pushed downward and you get something called pelvic organ prolapse. More commonly, people will tell me, my bladder dropped or my uterus dropped, or my uterus is falling out. It's not really falling out, that's a much bigger problem. But that prolapse is actually the, the walls of the vagina for women kind of collapsing in on themselves. And so if those pelvic floor muscles aren't strong, this is what happens over time, especially after menopause. That's when we tend to see it the most. But I have seen women that have just had a baby that have this pelvic organ prolapse. This is the sphincteric function. So this kind of shows you, this is a picture of the bladder. Here's your pelvic floor muscles and here's your urethra. So the pelvic floor muscles actually surround the urethra and when they're at that low level of contraction, they're contracted around the urethra and they're keeping it closed. And when you cough or sneeze or laugh or run or do any sort of movement, they actually will contract a little bit harder to kind of meet that demand of pushing down through the bladder. So so very important to have nice strong muscles with that. This is the other thing, this is actually your rectum, and so there's this phenomenal muscle called the puborectalis. It works as kind of a sling around the rectum, and again, when you're just sitting here, if you're not actively having a bowel movement, it is contracted. And what it's doing is it's pulling against that rectum, and it's keeping all of the feces in there. When you are ready to have a bowel movement, what happens is this muscle actually relaxes and allows the rectum to become vertical and allows you to have a bowel movement. So common misconception, a lot of people when they're straining are doing more harm than good because they're trying to push that, that poop out of a uh, contracted muscle. And so that can cause even more problems later on. And I do say poop and pee a lot too. And it doesn't, I don't use euphemisms for it because it's not really worth it. Um, so stabilizers, uh, again, this is just kind of showing that pop can model that you've got the diaphragm on the top, you've got your abdominal muscles and your back muscles, but that pelvic floor also provides important stabilization and provides support up against those forces that are coming down uh, towards it and really, really help keep your core strong. So your pelvic floor muscles must be strong in order to be able to work properly with all four of those functions. Now, a tight muscle or a muscle with spasticity is not a strong muscle. I think everybody knows here knows that. So we have to work on that spasticity first and then we will work on the strengthening. So with a lot of my MS clients, what I tend to see is if they do go on some anti-spasticity medication or they do get a baclofen pump, they will all of a sudden sometimes develop some incontinence. And that's because uh, that spasticity up until that point had been kind of protective against the incontinence. Now we relax those muscles. They don't have a strong pelvic floor. And so now they're having some incontinence. So it's definitely something that we need to, to protect against. Uh, we also, so we have to be able to contract those muscles quickly or on demand. So if you cough, you should be able to do a nice quick contraction. But you also need to have endurance in those muscles. And that's so you can get to the bathroom. That's when you get that urge and you feel like, okay, I got to go, but the bathroom is all the way down the hallway to the right and to the left. You need to be able to sustain that pelvic floor muscle contraction and sustain that endurance in order to be able to get to the bathroom. And then you also have to be able to relax those muscles. That Again, that's when you sit down on the toilet and you want to have a bowel movement or you want to pee. Um, you want to make sure that you can relax those muscles. And by the way, I do realize that I'm talking about bowel movements and urinating right during dinner, which is always awesome. <laughs> it's a good dinner topic of conversation. This is why no one invites me out to dinner because this is the kind of stuff I talk about. Um, all right, and I um, wanted to also show you the bladder. So our bladder is really, really an awesome organ. It's, uh, it's got muscle fibers that kind of stretch in all directions like a balloon. So if it's working properly, it should be able, as it fills, to stretch in all directions, not just up, not just sideways, in all directions in order to fill properly. If it doesn't, that's where you can get some of that urgency or that feeling that you have to go even though you just went. Um, this is something with the bladder that we can't necessarily fix as pelvic floor therapists. This is when, one of the times when you may need to see a urologist. Uh, but the bladder, um, there are some things that we can do that are a little bit protective with the bladder. 
So now we're gonna talk about good bladder habits. So quote unquote normal bladder habits, because I rarely meet a normal person, even as a pelvic floor therapist, I'm guilty of some of these bad bladder habits. So going to the bathroom seven to 10 times a day. Every time I tell people that, they're always a little surprised because that seems like a lot, but it's really not. So seven to 10 times a day is within normal limits for urinating. Getting up one time a night to go to the bathroom is also normal. Uh, if you're over age 65, that jumps up to two times a night because uh, you start that has more to do with kidney function than, than your bladder. But if you're getting up one time a night, that's actually considered okay. Uh, able to delay urinating until the appropriate time, meaning if you get that urge to go to the bathroom, you don't have to run there. All right, that you can say, okay, it's time for me to go to the bathroom. The bathroom's over there. I can make it without leaking. Able to wait at least two to three hours between voids. So, and that goes for both, both ways. We don't want you waiting 12 hours between voids. Uh, so we want you to be able to wait at least two hours between when you go to the bathroom and when you have to go again. But we also want you to go every two to three hours. Able to initiate urination very quickly after sitting down, meaning you, you don't have to sit there for two to three minutes and, you know, hum happy birthday in order to go to the bathroom. Uh, not straining to urinate or defecate. So one of the worst things you can do for your bladder is push on it to try and urinate. We really uh, advise against that. And then you should not have pain with urination or defecation. So bad bladder habits, peeing at first urge. And this is where I get a lot of people, they do what we call just in casing. So um, I'm about to leave the house, I'm gonna pee just in case. And then when I get to the store, I'm gonna pee just in case again. I have patients that know where every bathroom in the city of Columbus is because they every time they get somewhere, they feel like they have to pee, even though they don't necessarily have an urge to urinate or it's just a mild urge. Your bladder can hold about 600 hundred cc's of fluid and most of my clients that are coming in that say that oh I'm going to the bathroom 20 or 30 times a day are only holding about 100 cc's of, of fluid so your bladder can stretch and it's a muscle if you don't use it you lose it so if you don't allow it to stretch it will actually shrink so it's one of those things that we really have to, to encourage patients to stretch that out. Squatting over the toilet. How many people's moms told you never sit down on public toilet seat? My mom did. That's a horrible thing to do. Because when you squat over a toilet, what you're doing is you're teaching, your pel you're teaching yourself to pee through contracted pelvic floor muscles, which ultimately leads to incontinence. So squatting over, I tell people, just put a lot of toilet paper down. It's okay. <laughs> um, whatever you do, don't squat over that toilet. Straining to urinate, so that's either really pushing or valsalving, to, or you know, grunting to urinate, or pushing on your bladder, also very bad. And then getting up multiple times per night to urinate. When I have people that tell me, oh, you know, I, I get up four or five times, I tell them, are you waking up because you need to pee, or are you peeing just because you woke up? So, and a lot of times it's the latter. It's that they woke up because of something else and they thought, well, I don't want to get out of bed later. I don't want to wake up again. I'm just going to go to the bathroom now. That's a really, really bad habit. Some of the typical bladder issues that I see with uh, patients with MS, urgency, so that got to go, got to go, got to go right now. Um, frequency, so going multiple times, sometimes going multiple times an hour. The inability to initiate flow, so again, just having to wait a long time. Painful urination, and then constipation is a huge one. So um, if you are constipated all the time, you're gonna have to go more frequently. There's only so much room in your pelvis, so if your pelvis is filled with stool, your bladder is not gonna be able to expand properly. So all of these things can be helped by physical therapy, believe it or not. Some of it is us looking at your bowel and bladder habits. Some of it's working on those pelvic floor muscles. Um, urgency can be because of two things. It can be because you've, your bladder has gotten smaller because you have uh, participated in some of those poor bladder habits, or it can be something called overactive bladder, meaning that the bladder is contracting when it's not supposed to. Uh, one of these can be helped by physical therapy. The other one is physical therapy, perhaps with some of the urologic medications.
So some quick bladder and bowel tips. I can't give everything away for free, but I'm gonna give you at least a couple. Um, drink water. So everybody tells me, well, I limit my fluid intake because I don't wanna pee. That's actually the opposite of what you should be doing. When we don't drink anything, and especially when we don't drink water, our urine becomes very concentrated in our bladder, which is very irritating to the bladder, which causes us to go more. So everybody looks at me like I have three heads when they say I'm going to the bathroom 15 times a day and I tell them, well, you need to drink more water. It's, that's just because we're trying to dilute the urine and we're trying to keep it from being very irritating to the bladder. I tell people just sip throughout the day. Well, what I tell most of my patients is after breakfast, I want you to get just a 12 to 20 ounce bottle of water. I want you to fill it up. It's your goal to drink it by lunch. You wanna refill it at lunch and it's your goal to finish the second one by dinner. That's it. It's not six to eight glasses a day. It's not 80 ounces of water a day. Two bottles of water a day is enough to be protective to your bladder. Lots of fiber. So um, I tell people, well, I eat whole wheat bread. You'd have to eat an entire loaf of bread a day to get enough fiber <laughs> in, in your day. That's uh, a loaf of bread or one slice of wheat bread has maybe one to two grams of fiber. You're supposed to have 35 grams a day, which is a lot of fiber. It is, but there are lots of different ways we can get it. I have a whole list of fiber foods that I give everybody um, in order to try and get that. We'll find something that you like from a fiber perspective. Uh, urge suppression, so not going the first second that you have an urge, waiting to see, do I really have to go? I just went 15 minutes ago, or can I at least try to wait? A lot of, for a lot of my patients, it's that fear of leaking. I don't want to leak, and so that's why I'm going to keep going to the bathroom. What they don't realize is, is that they're training their bladder to be small, they're training their bladder to contract more often, and they're actually training themselves to leak. So we talk a lot about urge suppression, and kind of figuring out, you know, am I just kind of nervous or do I really, really have to go to the bathroom? Bladder timing, I call it potty training for adults. You know, when you have a toddler, you have them, do you have to go to the bathroom every hour on the hour? We kind of do that. We kind of do bladder check-ins and, and going to the bathroom every couple of hours, even if we don't need to. So that can sometimes uh, work for some of our, our MS clients. And then limiting fluids before bedtime. Uh, you want to stop fluids at least two hours before you're going to lay down to go to sleep because you don't want to fill up your bladder. Our kids and our urine production does slow when we go to sleep if you're getting good sleep uh, but you want to stop drinking and stop those fluids just to kind of help that bladder along and to help you be able to get to sleep it's hard to fall asleep when your bladder is full uh, toilet positioning so how many people have heard or seen the squatty potty it's something that I wish I had come up with. All it is is a stool that goes under your feet when you're uh, having a bowel movement and they're making a whole lot of money on it. The, what you actually want to be, the position that you want to be in when you're trying to have a bowel movement is this squatted position. Because what that does is it helps you more effectively relax that puborectalis muscle that I showed you. So when you're in that squatted position, when your hips are bent up a little bit more, um, it's why babies, like you ever seen a little toddler go behind a chair and squat in the corner to poop that's because toddlers sometimes are smarter than us as adults and so they're, they're getting themselves into an effective position for defecation so positioning yourself properly on the toilet can go a long way for that pelvic floor muscle relaxation and keeping you from straining Kegel exercises, everybody, regardless of if you have MS or not, should be doing them every day. And usually this is when people start to try and do them in their chairs, because I'm reminding them of them. Um, you have to train for both endurance or speed. So you can't just say, okay, just do 10 quick Kegels um, a couple times a day and you'll be all right. You have to do ones where you hold that muscle a little bit. It should be a squeeze and a lift. So it's not just kind of squeezing as hard as you can. You should feel some things lift up. Between 60 and 80 contractions a day. So I say 10 quick contractions, 10 slow contractions back to back, three to four times a day. And then also be able to effectively relax that muscle. So when they bear down, you should be able to open up and either have a bowel movement or urinate. 
So what can a pelvic floor therapist do for me? We evaluate you and everybody gets an individualized program. That's why I said I can only give a few tips because unless I feel your pelvic floor, I don't know what it's doing. So after the evaluation, we'll also analyze what we call a bladder diary, which is I have you kind of fill out um, how many times a day you're going to the bathroom, things like that. We look at it and we see where your problems lie. And then I'm gonna prescribe you exercises, some core stabilization, and then a bowel and bladder behavioral program. Like I said, it's toilet training for adults. So we're gonna, everybody's is a little bit different. It's gonna be based on what your specific issues are. Uh, and that's uh, kind of that individualized program. Therapy is never one size fits all. And if you have a therapist that tells you it's one size fits all, they're really not a good therapist. So every patient gets a little bit different program. Some of the elements are the same, but everybody that sees me gets an individualized program. So that is um, bowel and bladder. It, there is a National Kegel Exercise Day. It's May 6th. We missed it, just <laughs> FYI. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, this, that was great. Um, I learned a lot, and I've actually seen a pelvic floor therapist, and it does work, so I, got, I could talk to you about that if you want later. Now we're moving on to the question and answer session for Dr. Nicholas and for our specialist here. So remember, I would like you to keep the questions general. You know, it'd be great to be able to talk specific, like this morning I woke up and my foot hurt and I took XYZ pill and it didn't work still. So what do you think, Dr. Nicholas? What else should I take? We can't do those kind of questions, but we keep them general, things that everyone can relate to, please. And the other thing is there will be people circulating with microphones. So if you'll wait and just indicate you have a question, they'll come to you with the microphone and help you get that so we're sure to capture the question appropriately on the video, on the filming. So we'll go first question. There's one right there. Okay, go for it. Hi, Karina. Um, thank you for that presentation. What about the phenomenon that people have where I have to pee? Pee. <laughs> so that, that urgency that I got to go this second. So that is usually due to a couple of different things. It can be due to kind of some of those poor, poor bladder habits where the pelvic floor or the bladder is contracting uncontrollably. Um, and it can be due to weakness in the pelvic floor. What happens with our pelvic floor is when our bladder is full, it pushes down on our pelvic floor, which sends a signal up to our brain that says, hey, you might wanna start going to the bathroom now. If your pelvic floor is too weak, even just a little bit of urine in that bladder is gonna push way down on that pelvic floor and send that signal up to the brain and the brain thinks it's, it's an emergency. I gotta go right now. So one of the things that we do is, first of all, we make sure that the bladder, uh, you know, we have really, really nice, clear urine in that bladder that's not irritating the lining of the bladder. And then we also strengthen the pelvic floor in order to make sure that that signal doesn't, doesn't happen. So it is very, very common and it's usually a combination of of those two things. Uh, very rarely do I find that um, doing those things doesn't at least improve it a little bit. Sometimes we still have to maybe go to a urologist and, and kind of take some medications. Or sometimes I've had some patients that if it's really severe, we start with some medication and then kind of wean you off of it depending on, on what's going on. But it's, it's, it can actually be helped with the pelvic floor therapy. Next question. As for Dr. Nicholas, um, I'm interested in the high salt diet, uh, how they come up with that as being like a cause of the MS or uh, contributing to that. Is that like um, if you ate a lot of salt growing up or, it, it, you know, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So actually, this came up a couple of years ago. Um, there was a really good study that was actually done in uh, mouse models, um, which is where everything uh, interesting in MS started. 
but uh, basically looking at uh, inflammatory cytokines in MS and that uh, increased levels, uh, increased intake of sodium chloride, which is table salt, um, basically increased these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, so initially that idea has been brought up looking as increasing the risk of autoimmune disease in general, um, but some smaller studies have looked at that in MS. We haven't really delineated you know, what level is too high or, or what level is it. It's not that we've pinpointed that high salt definitively causes MS. It's just something that's been interesting because we see that that uh, enhances inflammation. And so that that's been something that in recent years we've been concerned is uh, potentially a risk factor and something that could potentially cause uh, more inflammation during the course of the disease. But there's a lot more work that needs to be done. But I think we all know that too much salt isn't good for us anyway, so it's just uh, one other part of our diet that we could take a look at and try to cut back. Um, this question is for the physical therapy lady. I forgot her name. Karina. Karina. Um, you, you mentioned that um, I was always taught um, to drink a lot of water, eight, 10 ounce glasses. Uh, I'm an athlete, so um, in athletics, you want to drink a whole lot of water. So I wanted to know if there was something or if you had any advice for people who run or bike um, and so drink a lot of water. So we do tailor that kind of water recommendation based on the amount of activity that you are doing, but a lot of the old water recommendations are kind of grossly overinflated. So there's been water recommendations as far as, you know, you weigh this much, this is how much you should be drinking, um, or that the, the eight to 10 glasses of water a day. Uh, so we kind of look at that. Uh, that's why I said the 48 ounces is just a good general rule, a good general guideline. If you're doing more that day than it is good, especially especially while you're exercising. That's when we, uh, you know, because we want to replace the water that you're losing. But if you're not exercising that day, then you can cut down on your water intake. The most important thing is not drinking it in giant gulps. So I have people that, you know, drink those huge bottles of water all at once. That's actually not good for your bladder. You want to sip it either throughout your workout, throughout your day, uh, and make sure that you're, you're, you've got kind of a constant intake of water going. The biggest uh, indicator of not drinking enough water is thirst. If you're thirsty, you don't, that's your body telling you you don't have enough water. Uh, the other thing you can do is look at the color of your pee. So the, your pee should be a nice butter color. Again, great dinner conversation. Um, so if it's kind of a light yellow, then you know you're actually getting enough water. If it's really clear, which I have a lot of athletes that were told, well, you, you should pee clear, that's actually too much. You're overhydrating. And then if it's a dark yellow, then you're not getting enough water. Question over here. This is for Karina. Um, when your bladder is full and you go to urinate and you think you're finished, you get up, wash your hands, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, I didn't go all the way. And then you sit back down, but it's like your brain is having to tell you to relax and you're sitting there waiting because you know you've got to go what happens? So that can be for a couple of reasons. One of the things is that, especially if you've had children, um, sometimes your bladder can tip a little bit or it can, it, the walls can become a little bit weaker. So sometimes that phenomenon is that you stand up and the water, the fluid that was in the back of the bladder kind of sloshes forward and all of a sudden you need to go, but you've kind of contracted those pelvic floor muscles in order to stop going. So one of the tricks that I tell people, if you have have that happen frequently is what we call the double void. So you think you're finished, you kind of stand up, not all the way, and then you just sit right back down. It's not enough time for those muscles to, to fully become contracted again, but if there is any fluid kind of caught at the back of your bladder, then we can kind of push it forward. Uh, that's really on a case-by-case -case basis, and again, I can tell very quickly with doing that pelvic exam uh, if that is the problem because the, the wall is going to be really, really weak and I can feel that on internal exam. But double voiding is something that I frequently have my patients do uh, in order to get that last little bit out. Karina, in the back. Can you talk about retention? Um, 
And a little bit about how we address retention, please. Yeah, so urinary retention is is a big problem in uh, patients with MS. And so there are a couple of different things. Uh, one is if you have what's called an atonic bladder, meaning the bladder is not contracting appropriately, and that's the reason why you're retaining, that is something that we are going to have to probably address with catheterization uh, because the bladder is not contracting appropriately. Uh, again, we used to recommend people kind of do what we called the crede, which was pre on the bladder, we don't do that anymore. That's really um, contraindicated now. Uh, so what we do is we do a combination of catheterization and pelvic floor training. The other reason for retention, though, is, is that pelvic floor is not relaxing properly. It's not allowing things to open up and you're retaining fluid. And so uh, what we do is I do what, what's called pelvic floor relaxation. It's a combination of actually uh, massaging the muscles internally in an effort to get them to relax, and then we also do something called biofeedback, which is where I put electrodes on the outside of your pelvic floor muscles, and you can actually see on a computer screen what your muscles are doing. So it helps you to kind of create that brain muscle um, connection again that you've lost. So uh, those are the two main things that we do with retention. Uh, and again, if we uh, if we can't succeed with those, then we may have to go to medications. Next question. Hi, this could probably be for both of you. Um, both of you have addressed diet, um, and I've heard a bunch of different things. I've heard any, you know, the gluten-free, the dairy-free. Um, I, I never really understood the dairy thing, but is there, like, are there just general guidelines, or is it just, like, healthy eating, like... Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so there, there's a lot of hype out there about diet and MS. Um, Unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of good quality research on that. So if you look on the internet, you'll see things about gluten-free diet and MS, about Wall's diet, um, about how you know diets could make somebody who's in a wheelchair walk again. Um, unfortunately, uh, those haven't really panned out. And so what we do know as far as diet is that certainly um, intake of vitamin D is important. We know that vitamin D is very beneficial in MS. So certainly if your levels are low, that we want to make sure that we're supplementing those. And actually those levels are supposed to be much higher than uh, what uh, the lab says is normal for an individual in folks that have MS. Also, again, you know, there has been this interest in the high salt diet uh, potentially causing increased uh, inflammation. And so I would recommend watching that. But in general, really, we want to make sure that you're eating a healthy diet because you've got MS, we don't want you to also develop diabetes or heart disease or something else that's gonna cause a lot more complications or potentially put weight on you um, and cause more problems with your physical activity and movement. And so, um, you know, there, there's been a lot of ways that we've looked at this, uh, but so far there's really no proven diet that's actually going to prevent worsening of MS. And so that's the most important thing. I do tell my patients, uh, because I've actually had many patients come in and say, you know what, Dr. Nicholas, I decided to go on the gluten-free diet, and I really like it, and I feel great. I think that's wonderful. Um, if they're feeling better on that, that's great. But the one thing that I do say is, you know, at the same time, let's make sure that we also do what's proven uh, to prevent worsening of your MS in the form of, you know, if you have relapsing MS, we want you to be on a disease-modifying therapy. So again, um, free to investigate those options, but again, there's not a lot of hard evidence supporting that. And I would just say from a bowel and bladder perspective, it's the same thing. We kind of look and see what makes your bowel and bladder function the most effectively, and, and that's what we go with. But a lot of it has to do with the inflammation in the gut as well and how that's affecting your bowel and bladder. So um, we talk, I work really closely with a nutritionist as well, and we go through um, some of those diets, mainly from a digestive standpoint, not so much from the worsening of MS. This, these questions are for Dr. Nicholas. I had a couple clarifying questions on pregnancy. Um, could you clarify the name of the drug, um, or maybe there's more than one that's category B that is perhaps safe to take? Yeah, so the category B medication is called Copaxone. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm familiar with it, thank you. Yeah. And then my second question, you were explaining how the new research shows that um, breastfeeding may be protective. Um, 
due to keeping the hormone levels high. Um, does that delay the fourth trimester then effects? Do you still, when those hormones level levels drop, when you stop breastfeeding, are you still at risk for the fourth trimester experience then? It doesn't replace it, it just kind of delays it. So that's a great point. That's something that I, I've thought about quite a bit, and there's actually no study that specifically looked at that. There was a recent study in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the most prestigious, um, and basically what it showed is that in terms of return to uh, increased disease activity, whether a woman um, breastfed or um, did not breastfeed, that her disease activity started to return again in that time period, just as, as you had mentioned. Interestingly, you know, when we know that someone's stopping breastfeeding, what we're gonna do at that point is make sure that we're getting you started um, back on disease-modifying therapy. If you decided to be on Copaxone during that time and you like it and you're doing good and you have a prior history of doing well on that, that's wonderful, you can continue. But if you were somebody who maybe needed a therapy that was very highly efficacious and we knew that you had very aggressive of disease, we would want to be making a move then when you say, you know what, I'm starting, I'm weaning from breastfeeding, we'd say, okay, you know, as soon as you've weaned, we're going to, we're going to start this medicine and have a really good plan of where to start. Whereas in a lot of women, when they go into that fourth trimester postpartum, they've just delivered, they might maybe haven't set that up yet because they weren't sure if they're going to be breastfeeding or not. So it may be many months before they get back on their DMT. Question over here. Yes. Hi, Karina. I would like to have your complete contact information on it. You may have had it up in the beginning, but I, I missed it. I did not. So I do work for Ohio Health. Um, I am at our Neuro Rehab Center is where I see uh, all our clients with MS, which is in Upper Arlington. So I will make sure that they get that information and we'll maybe put it out on the front table. But yeah, I, I, am, I see mainly um, neuro patients at the UA. Hello. Hi, Dr. Nicholas. I have a question about maybe the next couple of upcoming therapies, maybe disease-modifying therapies, that are around the bend that are getting you excited for future interventions for relapsing or letting MS. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a really great question and a timely question because we've been talking about this quite a bit lately at the MS Center. Um, so one of the newest therapies that will likely be the next to come out is a medication called ocrelizumab. So uh, this is an IV infusion. It's something that's administered once every six months. When you get your first dose, you actually get a dose on day one and then a dose on day 14 and then again six months later um, and then every six months thereafter. Uh, uh, it's a therapy that even though it's it's going to be new and the fact that it's likely going to come out end of 2016, uh, early 2017, um, we're very familiar with it. There's another uh, sister drug to this medication called rituximab that some of you may be very well aware of or may uh, be on or have heard of. Um, that therapy has uh, been used for a long time in diseases like lupus and other autoimmune diseases, um, but we do use it in MS actually when we were at OSU, we did a, a clinical trial looking at that rituximab in primary progressive MS. Um, but it was really wonderful that when we saw the final phase three clinical trial results come out for ocrelizumab in the fall at our European MS meeting, that it was not only shown to be effective in relapsing MS, which you know is what we have all our therapies for, but finally it's been shown to be effective in primary progressive MS in delaying disability. And so that's something that we're incredibly excited for. Uh, it's something that actually acts on B cells. So many of our MS drugs early on, we used to just focus on a type of white blood cell called T cells, but this drug is actually going to focus on B cells. Um, and we know from the history with rituximab that it's highly effective. And I would consider it along the lines of the effectiveness of a Tysabri or even more so. And so I think that's really exciting. You know, I like these more convenient options for patients. It's something, again, that we don't have out right now. We're actually doing a clinical trial um, where we have it available at Ohio Health in one of our clinical trials. Um, but that therapy is very exciting. There's a similar molecule 
that uh, I'm starting up a clinical trial in September, and it's called Ofatumumab, so I want everybody to say that 10 times fast, um, and whoever can say it 10 times wins a special prize. I don't know who makes up these names, but it's, it's a very similar medication to that, except that it's a subcutaneous injection that you could give yourself at home once a month and again appears to be highly effective and safe and so we're very very excited about these highly efficacious therapies that may be more convenient uh, modes of administration and make it easier to be adherent because you don't have to remember to take something every day or every other day or once a week um, and so incredibly excited you know I've been excited for a long time about another therapy called anti-lingo um, which is uh, a therapy that's been looked at for uh, repair, uh, restoration, and remyelination of damaged axons in MS. Uh, but this therapy, uh, unfortunately, when the most recent clinical trial results came out, um, did not meet the goal that it set out to, to meet. However, on certain other markers, it was shown to be beneficial. And so I think that that's something that's going to be looked at a little bit differently. When I was at our last uh, MS meeting just this past month, the consortium of MS centers meeting. There are lots of other early phase one studies being done on other molecules that are looking to repair and remyelinate. And I think that's the next wave of what we're gonna see in MS. It's about time, right? We have all these wonderful drugs that we can try to stop the progression and prevent relapses and keep people doing well. But gosh, if we had something to turn back time and take you back to where you were before, that's the goal. All right, we only have time for one more question and then we're going to transfer over to Dr. Boster. So we have one more in the back of the room here. Okay, so when talking about um, bowel and bladder issues, if I have an MS attack that's affecting my hand and I don't have usage of my hand, um, you know, that's kind of serious. So is kind of the same thing, does that happen with your bowel and bladder where it doesn't matter how many strength training um, uh, exercises I do when I'm in the midst of attack? And that is true. So there are times when um, there, there, there is nothing that we can do. When you're in the midst of an attack, if you have a lot of increase in spasticity or a lot of increase in, in other muscular issues, that is going to affect your bowel and bladder. But what we do during those times is we really make sure that you're practicing those good bowel and bladder habits. You're being pr as protective with the bowel and bladder as you can. So drinking that water, eating that fiber, making sure that everything else is okay. And then there are some other things with the pelvic floor that that we can do to kind of prevent. Um, there are some, some other uh, continence devices and things that we can do to, to help prevent uh, some of the incontinence problems and some of the urgency problems. So um, we kind of have two different bowel and bladder plans. We have kind of when everything's going well and then we usually um, have a flare up bowel and bladder plan. So we work with patients with that. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for coming down today.